I'm Joyita Gupta, and this is The Pulse. When Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality, it changed how we thought about oppression. No longer were people just black, or just disabled, or just a woman. Our lives exist at the crossroads of many facets of identity. For Canadians who are black and disabled, there is a need for dedicated programs and services which address this complex, intersectional lived reality. After the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests, there were urgent conversations about race relations and especially anti-black racism. But we must go deeper. After all, if one is black and disabled, they live on the margins of the margins. Today, we discuss the advocacy aspect of being black and disabled. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. I'm Joyita Gupta, joining you from the Accessible Media Studios in Toronto. We've been covering over the last few episodes various perspectives and points of view on being black and disabled, hearing from a number of different voices, all Canadian. We started with Tina Opalake, who was um, a parent and talked about her journey navigating the healthcare system with her small child and also did an amazing spoken word piece that I would encourage you to check out. There was also my conversation with Dolores Lamptey, who is the inaugural Embark Scholar at Holland Bloorview Rehab Hospital and who intends to found in that capacity READ, the Race, Ethnicity and Disability Lab. We're building on those previous conversations with my guest today. My guest today is Lisa Arneson. Lisa is the founder and chairperson for Ashe Community Foundation for Black Canadians with Disabilities. She talks to me about the role of the foundation, some of their work, including research and advocacy. They are creating the country's first ever Black Accessible Knowledge Hub, which will be going live as early as this April. Liza shares her journey and why it's so important for Black Canadians with disabilities to have not only a seat at a table, but a voice that makes a difference. So I hope you'll tune in to hear Liza. She is someone who does a lot of talking, she loves to talk, and has amazing analysis and insight onto why it's so important for Black people with disabilities, especially Black youth with disabilities, to get involved and make a difference. Lisa, hello and welcome to The Pulse. I'm so happy to have you on the program. Bonjour. And thank you for having me this morning. Nice and bright here in Toronto. It's a beautiful day in Toronto, that's for sure. Tell me a little bit about what the word ashe means. May I just start with, um, I'm a light-skinned black woman. I mm-hmm. wear, I love purple, so I'm wearing purple glasses. I have my hair short and curly. And um, I have a little broader nose for those. Mm-hmm. I am... What does Ashe mean? The Ashe Community Foundation for Black Canadians with Disabilities, also known as the Ashe Community, it it means the word itself is a Yoruba word that is ancient meaning as well as um, mean, meaning today. Uh, Yoruba is an African uh, is is in Nigeria, and it means the es- essence of the the mind to manifest something into existence. So it means, so you say, so it will be, ashe, almost like an amen, an affirmation. And we, when we were thinking about this and looking at the barriers and the discrepancies that we endure, either through disability-led organizations or other organizations that don't understand disability or Blackness, we realize we have to make this happen, and it is by all means it will happen all means it will happen. So Ashe. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tell me a little bit about some of the work that the Ashe Community Foundation does. Well, um, we are primarily a volunteer organization right now and always looking for funding and support um, to give, um, to pay and pay equitably um, Black people with disabilities who are contributing to this work. So what we do specifically is at the core, our mission is to eradicate anti-Black racism, um, ableism, and gender um, discrimination and gender-based violence, making it 
a, 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 a fair and free um, community for everyone across the board. Um, so we have strategic priorities and um, those strategic priorities start with one that we're launching this month in March. So please look out for us. We've been working on a the first national black accessibility knowledge hub in Canada. And this is going to house black focused, racialized focused, um, disability lens, a disability um, service directory, disability resources, and then a, also a searchable research policy knowledge catalog. So we're looking for submissions, but we're also going to be open for anyone and it's free for everyone. The purpose of this is again, to, to con consolidate all the knowledges, all the services. So black people um, or racialized people are looking for a culturally relevant psychiatrist or psychologist or nutritionist or dietitian, or they don't know how to apply for the, the disability tax credit. All of that information will be there, including research, which is another category that a Shea community is involved with. We've done one particular one um, with Employment and Social Development Canada, the Disability Inclusion Unit, Social Inclusion Unit, on the capacity building of the research project on the capacity building um, of racialized and Black community organizations led by Black and racialized people with disabilities. So that was core. And it, what it did is it not only um, found many of the gaps from the, in, the experiences of people like me who lead organizations either off their their tables in their kitchens or wherever they are like us, but we found them across Canada. We are there, we do exist, we're just not heavily funded. And so we, we wrote some engagement um, strategies, or what others would call recommendations to the government on how to engage with our population and how to include us in their work and their policy and their funding criteria. The next thing we work on is a knowledge platform. So you're going to see as well uh, a national black um, accessibility um, coalition, collective, whatever we come up with it will be. And it will house our youth coalition of black youth with disabilities, which already exists. And it will house a research collective of people doing this type of work. And it will house um, black people with disabilities across Canada in the territories where they can have their voices heard and brought to the forefront instead of maybe being asked at the end of a research project or a policy review, what do you think? And um, then we also have youth initiatives, which I spoke about um, um, the coalition, but we also have an annual Black Youth Disability Summit for three days at the end of August. Anybody's welcome, everybody attends. We just make sure that we talk about the intersection of race and disability and, and the resources that are available. Um, so we do a variety of things. All, everything is at the point of making sure that our voices are heard, that we are seen as, as people, not just in um, within the disability movement, as we have been on the peripheral, and we continue to be on the peripheral, not invited to the, the room, even to the point of being told at a major event, it's a fire code violation why you can't join our coalition. Now, for people who are racialized or Black or Indigenous, we've heard this before. It comes in many different forms, and all was said. It's too small. There's not enough space. You have to be on the list, blah, blah, blah. And this is from leading disability organizations in Canada. That's why we exist. Because at the moment, it's not even about um, adding a chair to the table. It's about even finding out where the meaning is and getting the code to be selected, to be on a list, to make decisions. And, at this, uh, and that's what we found when we went across Canada with a black and racialized led organizations led by people with disabilities is that we're not in the conversation. And, and also many times, even organizations that are leading 
in disability themselves, their boards or their, or their organizations are not led by the lived experience of peoples, persons with disabilities and definitely not led by Black, Indigenous, or racialized people with disabilities, even though they add intersectionality to their tag. And then they hire a few lower level precarious staff that are racialized, maybe disabled. And they add that and they throw somebody on their board that doesn't have power. And then they claim intersectionality. So you used that term earlier about intersectionality and, and Kimberly um, Crutcher. I want to bring everybody back to one of the major influencers in my life. I'm, I'm 53 years old. So when I was growing up in Calgary, Alberta, and went to the University of Calgary, one of the f maybe less than 20 um, Black people at all in the institution at the time in the 80s, in the early 90s, I came across somebody called, uh, um, oh my goodness, how can I not? Uh, Audrey Lord. Oh. And if you know... If, He's amazing. Yeah, oh, Jolita, what <laughs> happened? I think I saw something happen. If I say Audrey Lord, what do you say? Oh, she's just, uh, they're just amazing, amazing. Um, yes. If people were to say we weren't talking about intersectionality back then, we were. She talked about intersectionality. She talked about that in all of her work as a queer black woman who which was excluded but uh, every once in a while included in the women's movement and if any if you want to read something that's very interesting enough look it's on my desk the master stools will never destroy the master's house that was that's that was right Audrey Lord's if you seminal get work. this book it was a speech that she recreated at a women's conference and that she had no play they invited her but had no interest in doing anything different and she changed up what she was going to say and she said this it ended up being published and if you understand what someone might say the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house and you have an understanding of what black lives matter is talking about what idle no more is talking about what warriors trying to um, eradicate the histories and the systems and structures that were built off colonialism. So we follow, we work within a disability justice framework. We work within black feminism and we work within an adapted version of critical race theory with the hope that we will be able to create a framework on black disability um, studies or black disability um, work. We haven't just, we don't know what that will be, but that's where we're, that's where we'd like to be. That's who, that's what we do. And we advocate, we uh, attend, um, we attend meetings, we sit on panels, we sit on things that they invite us to. We sit there where they don't invite us to. I did invite myself to the room that was um, a fire code violation. You're not on the list. I invited myself. I went in anyways, and it wasn't pleasant. And as a black woman who's lived with this her whole life, who cares if it's unpleasant for you? Because it's unpleasant for me all the time. And then we're talking about whiteness here. You can have a disability and not understand the black experience or the racialized experience. And this takes us into this intersectional thing. You can be black and not understand ableism. And your own role in the taboo subject of disability within the black and racialized or ethnic diasporas, because we know disability means and acts differently based on where people come from, their culture, their language, their faith. And this is even makes it even more complicated for black and racialized people with disabilities mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that uh, you're planning to hold a conference for youth and you're doing a, a lot of research with youth. Why was it so important for Ashe to have a focus on youth leadership? Oh, well, the first is youth are the ones that help build Ashe. The majority of the board and the staff 
are actually youth with elders like myself and more in between. Um, and I've been an assistant dean for students, um, international and community at the University of Toronto Scarborough for a long time before I went on leave. And I value the energy, the passion, the intelligence, the talent of youth with disability, youth, black youth. And then you realize that in you, when I'm in this education system, you realize that youth with disabilities don't get those taps on the shoulders to join, to be research assistants, to do this, because somebody's already decided based on their disability, they won't be able to do it. So I always, from and I worked at Ryerson, I founded the Trimentoring Program, again, another program interested in doing the same thing. And the idea is that youth have untapped talent. Black racialized people have untapped talent. Persons with disabilities have untapped talent. I'm smart, basically. I know who to bring into the organization to get things done, to get ideas flowing, because that's the group that does it, because they have all the flexibility based on navigating all these systems that aren't set for them. Why did we choose youth? The youth chose. As we built a shade, the youth was like, we need to do uh, an event because so many youth don't know what we've taught them because we always do extensive training. And so um, we came up with the idea with youth that worked with us in the summer to do uh, an annual summit. They organize it. They invite the professors. They invite the, the experts. They invite the keynotes. They organize the whole thing and we support it through a shake. And then from that, a year after that, they started still talking to student groups across Canada, Black student groups, student groups that work with disability, talking to needs, which became a really close um, community for us. And we realized that they needed a coalition. So they, start, they actually started with a student coalition and then this year changed it over to uh, a youth coalition um, for people under 30. So again, this whole drive is driven by youth, Black youth with disabilities. We also hire, and part of youth who do, are not Black, but are also persons with disabilities. And so we really want to focus and we want to make space for our, our people, our young people, so they can build and grow as leaders and take up those, space, those spaces of the deans or of the CEOs or of the person on the board or of the EDs of these organizations or of those policy advisors in, in the government. I believe in pipelines. I believe in creating black pipelines black women pipelines. I create, believe in creating persons with disabilities, racialized people, black people, indigenous people with disabilities pipelines. And unless we advocate for it, we will continue to be the number one group in Canada with the highest ratio of unemployment and underemployment is black people with disabilities off the stats can statistics. And that is significant. And that's why we focus on young people. And we use a mentoring, coaching, champion, mothering, parenting, whatever model we can to make them understand the talents and the skills that they offer. I only, and we build on those skills. We only have a few minutes left. And I want to ask you about what in your life prompted you to found Ashe? Because you've had many roles oh. in your life, and now you're an elder mentoring a lot of young people. What was that moment in your life where you said, Liz, it's time to do something different? It was forced on me. Mm. Um, I'll be honest. Anybody who's had a disability and hasn't told anybody ever that they had a disability, which is very common in the Black community and many other racialized communities as well. I did not tell anybody as the strong Black woman that I had disabilities for decades. And a few people knew, but I never asked for accommodations. After, after um, a significant surgery, it triggered a lots of other things, including um, chronic illness and post-traumatic stress. I asked for accommodations, was denied the accommodations. And it took me into depression, big depression. Um, basically, I would say a nervous breakdown. 
of questioning who I was, wasn't, you know, I wasn't believed. And that is an experience that Black women have often when they approach help, because it's seen as something other than, than that we need it, because we don't look like it. We don't look, depression doesn't look the same for racialized women and Black women and Indigenous women. The books and everything people have looked at, they look, they were studied on white people. So you don't know what it looks like for us. You don't know how we present. And unfortunately, while I was sitting at home feeling very sorry for myself and very angry all at the same time, I had this idea pop into my head. I called a colleague named Janelle Anderson and I, she herself, she's the vice chair and she has a disability as well, disabilities as well. And I said, hey, what do you think about this? Because every person I've spoken to that has a disability that's black and particularly a woman has had somewhat of the same experience, regardless of where they were, including in the black community. So he said, what do you think? I said, okay. And one day God told me that the word ashe, I'd never heard it in my life. I looked it up, heard, saw what it was, got on the computer, registered the ashe Community Foundation for Black Canadians with Disabilities. And that was it. That was it. That now, was we, it. now we've been in doing it for, this will be four years three years, three and a bit incorporated. That's amazing. You've you've uh, accomplished a lot in the last three plus years, and you are set to accomplish a great deal more in the years to come. If someone wants to contribute to or even look at the Black Knowledge Hub, the Accessible Knowledge Hub that we were talking about earlier in our conversation, where can they go? So the hub will be launched in March. So you can go there by April. But if you go to the Ashe Community dot com, Community Foundation dot com, you will find everything about us there. We will be switching over to a new website with the hub in March as well. Um, but it's A S E C O M M U N I T Y F O U N D A T I O N dot com. You can also email me. I love to chat, by the way. So if anybody loves to talk, email me at liz at arnestonconsulting.com. I'm also, I've also had a consulting business for over 20 years. And um, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Join us on, you know, please come and join our group on LinkedIn. And of course, find me on LinkedIn. We share a lot there. We talk a lot of major issues. We were, um, I just posted something about Spain giving sick days for menstrual time. And this is important because pe- um, there's lots of health issues or disabilities related for women during these times. And we're in the workforce, but it's never been considered. So these are the things I like. I, I want to press, press. I am an agitator and some people roll their eyes in meetings. Some people will, you know, like look away, like here she goes again. I I don't care. So I'm going to keep talking. Yeah. You're fighting the good fight. Liz, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, you, It's never pained me more to say that we are almost out of time. Uh, I hope you'll come back. The foundation is doing such great work, and I feel like this is the start uh, of many conversations, and I hope to have you back on the show. But thank you so much for speaking to us today. You are more than welcome. You have a wonderful day. Everyone have a wonderful day. Lisa Arneson is the founder and chairperson for Ashe Community Foundation for Black Canadians with Disabilities. You can always find their website. We'll put it in the description down below or contact Lisa by email. And of course, if you're a young person with a disability, I hope you will reach out, especially if you're black and disabled and a young person. It sounds like they're doing some great work and have lots of great programming and opportunities. So I hope you'll reach out to them. We should probably wrap it up for today. This is about as much time as we have for the show. It's been great to be with you today. If you have any feedback for us, you can write to us at feedback at ami.ca or find us on Twitter at AMI Audio. Use the hashtag Pulse AMI. You can also give us a call at 1-866-509-4545 and leave us a message along with your permission to play the audio on the program. Our videographer today has been uh, Ted Cooper. 
Uh, our technical producer is Marco Flalo. Ryan Delahanty is podcast coordinator for AMI Audio. Andy Frank is the manager for AMI Audio. And I've been your host, Joita Gupta. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.